Hello, my name is Rob Sides. I work at the scientific instruments business of Amatech. Amatech serves the electrochemistry community through the brands Princeton Applied Research and Solotron Analytical. So every year at the NACE meeting, the National Association of Corrosion Engineers, we're invited to give a, a seminar on the localized electrochemical corrosion measurements and techniques. Incredibly valuable seminar and on some emerging technology, uh, but it only happens one time per year. So by request, we're going to record this seminar and distribute it uh, to those interested. Uh, highlighted here will be our VersaScan system, and through our website, you can gain all kinds of information on our other products from single channel potential stats to multi channel potential stats to accessories and software. So, first, let's kind of define what we mean now by bulk electrochemistry measurements, and then we'll contrast that over to local measurements in a second. Uh, so from an electrochemical corrosion rate, rate measurement study, the, 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 the typical plot shown here is a TAFL plot in the top right-hand corner, and the procedure to generate such a plot is to apply a small voltage to a metal sample and drive the corrosion reaction. The corrosion reaction is an electrochemical reaction that causes current to flow, uh, and our potential stat measures that current. And then by knowing some physical properties of the materials, such as uh, molecular weight, density, some other things, we can convert the electrical current through the potentiostat uh, into a corrosion rate. So it's really a three-step process. I'm going to apply polarization. I'm going to cause that corrosion uh, to happen. I'm going to cause that corrosion reaction to happen. Then I'm going to measure the current. Uh, by measuring the current, it's going to be the rate of electrons or rate of reaction. And I'm going to convert that to a corrosion rate. But the, the key here is in converting that to a corrosion rate is I have to assume uniform distribution of current. And those of us who have been studying uh, the electrochemical, those of us who have been studying corrosion know that is rarely the case, if ever, that there's a uniform distribution of current or a uniform corrosion. So we need to develop some different techniques and higher technology to kind of study localized corrosion, localized uh, non-uniform corrosion. So if bulk techniques such as TAFL plots or LPR or EIS, the potential stat is going to measure an averaged or integrated current across the entire sample. It's not going to be able to distinguish electrons whether they happen in an intense pit or several less intense pits or if there's uniform corrosion. Functionally from the potential stat, all the electrons look the same. I don't know where they came from, only that they are flowing through the reaction. If I contrast that and then to localized measurements, it's all about where the measurement's being made. So instead of measuring at the probe, I'm going to measure at a, at a excuse me, instead of measuring at the sample, I'm going to measure at a probe that is positioned very close to the sample surface, but non-contact. And so in doing this in a way, we're talking, when I say close, let's put numbers on it, let's say about less than 100 microns away from the sample surface. The closer I get, generally, the higher the resolution. So uh, we'll talk about strategies and probe positioning a little bit later. But uh, this is about how far away we want to be from the sample surface. And to, to, to relate that back, that's about the diameter of a human hair. So I want to be about a, one human hair away from the sample surface without making contact to it. And then I'm going to scan uh, over that sample surface, the plane above that sample surface, and that's going to generate a data map for me. So I use this, uh, use this slide to kind of uh, define the term spatial resolution. And so when I think about spatial resolution, I really think about the, vol the sampling volume, or where is the measurement being made. In a bulk experiment, we're going to make the electrochemical measurement over the entire electrode-electrolyte interface, functionally everywhere that's wet. Everywhere it's the wet is going to be exposed to the electrolyte. It's going to be um, uh, you're going to get that you're going to get that reaction happening. So let's contrast that. Instead of measuring the entire uh, sample as you do in a bulk state, let's go over to the localized state and you can see that we're measuring a subset of the sample. I'm only going to measure the area kind of defined by the probe and the probe position and, and, uh, and these other type of parameters. And then I'm going to move the probe and make a series of this different type of measurements. So, so let's think a little bit about how if the sampling volume or spatial resolution is the blue dot here, in a bulk state I'm measuring the entire sample, in a localized state I'm going to measure a subset. But how is, I have this, this, this idea of spatial resolution, now let's think about how electrochemical sensitivity is affected. Well, if I have a very, very large probe, 
it's going to help my electrochemical sensitivity. Why is that? It's going to be because the there's going to be a larger signal and um, for me to measure. So I'm going to have better electrochemical sensitivity. But as the probe becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, the electrochemical sensitivity goes down, but the spatial resolution is improved. So we're going to see this kind of trade-off and this effect of uh, electrochemical sensitivity versus spatial resolution. And the key is, but with some really good measurement techniques and best practices and measurement electronics, we can extract the small signals from uh, the, the background. And that's going to allow us to get the, the small spatial resolution uh, and still be able to measure the, the small signals. So I've talked a lot about uh, the positioning system and a probe, and I'm going to take a probe and I'm going to move it down in Z axis and I'm going to move it in the X and Y axis to make the data map. Uh, so that tells you that 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 uh, a positioning system is a is going to be a key component to uh, to a scanning technology or localized measurement technology. So uh, the 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 purpose of the positioning system truly is to position the probe close to the sample surface, reducing sampling volume, thus increasing spatial resolution. And then uh, there's two different ways we can build positioning systems. We can build them as open loop positioning systems that are just going to scan, rely on factory calibrations uh, to kind of make sure that the or to, to ensure that the probe is moving in the way that we're directing it to do. Uh, but a higher technology approach is something called a closed loop positioning system that's going to independently verify the position of the probe. And so this is going to be basically a feedback mechanism where I'm going to I'm going to tell it to go. Uh, you know, to position 100 micron uh, by 100 microns, and then I'm going to feed, me independently measure it and feed it back to the positioning system, and I'm going to adjust uh, if it's not all the way there. So that means that systems based on closed loop positioning systems should not need factory calibration, and importantly, we should be able to change, um, uh, if, if, I, if I mount different different pieces of hardware on the front of the positioning system, I should not, uh, should not have to make any detail changes uh, on the positioning system parameters itself. So let's turn that positioning system into a scanning position system and really what's going to happen is we're going we're gonna to measure three things. We're going to measure a probe displacement, a probe position in either x direction or y direction. And then I'm going to actually measure something, right? And so that thing I measure might be electrochemical current, it might be potential, it might be topography, it might be impedance, uh, but I'm going to make some measurement. And so you can really envision these as really hundreds or thousands of different sub-experiments. Really, each pixel on a map is truly a, an independent little experiment. So what type of technology is used uh, to make these types of measurements and, and so what, we're, uh, what, what we provide is something called an electrochemical scanning workstation. Um, and so the basis for this is this positioning system pictured here uh, and this is com built completely on piezoelectric motors. And so piezos are devices where you apply a small voltage and they move a small distance but they do so very accurately. Uh, and so it, what we want to have is a system that can, can move in X and Y and Z with high accuracy, high resolution, but also have a large range. Because when we're looking at corrosion samples, we may be looking at large panels or maybe looking at more real world type samples. And so we want positioning systems to go beyond the micron scale into the millimeter scale. Uh, and so these piezoelectric uh, motors drive stages and these stages can go to 100 millimeters in each direction uh, down to nanometer type accuracies and resolution. Uh, so this is this is set up as a uh, SECM experiment which we'll talk about in a little while uh, but you'll see that you have a positioning system, you have a probe, and you have some measurement electronics. Those might be potential stats, those might be lock and amplifiers, uh, but uh, or um, you know it's uh, different technologies. But the the key here is that uh, there are different techniques that we can use in this workstation, uh, but they all have the common goal of providing spatial resolution and measuring you know uh, a given parameter. So what are some methods that people are using to do this? Uh, one of the most popular in the corrosion community is the scanning vibrating electrode technique. Uh, 
Uh, next probably is a localized electrochemical and peanut spectroscopy, uh, scanning droplet cell, scanning electrochemical microscopy or SCCM. And SCCM is probably the most popular technique uh, in the in the total field of electrochemistry, uh, with some some applications uh, uh, being shown here in the corrosion community as well. Other techniques that we'll that we'll touch on is something called a scanning Kelvin probe, uh, which is a non-destructive uh, type measurement uh, as well, um, using the same kind of platform. So for me, for an, as a trained electrochemist, it's it's much easier to kind of understand how the principles behind the scanning vibrating electrode technique. Uh, if I kind of start with where it came from, and the technology this is based on really is something called a scanning reference electrode technique that's been developed since as early as the 1940s. And so what Shret was doing, the scanning reference electrode technique, is it started by uh, you know taking basically a dual measurement probe. So let's imagine two independent platinum wires. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the voltage difference between these platinum wires. So why does there a voltage difference the existing uh, in my electrochemical cell? Well, as, a, as the corrosion process happens, there's local anodes and uh, form on the, the sample. These local anodes match up with the cathode and kind of, kind of generate a current that flows through the solution. The solution has some kind of resistance, so that is the R, the current being the I, and so that's going to create a, uh, a potential drop in solution. So it's going to be a potential difference within solution. And so really by measuring the potential difference between uh, two platinum probes, uh, what we can do is kind of map that field. And again, that field exists because of the corrosion uh, happening at the sample, and we're going to relate. We're going to map the position, understand where, and we're also going to use this to understand intensity. But in the, as I as I talked earlier on, there's a trade-off here between spatial resolution and electrochemical sensitivity. So let's take the extreme. If I take these two platinum wires and I put them very far apart, the potential drop may be very large at that point in time, but the spatial resolution is very poor. And so as technology, uh, the, the ability to measure voltage improves, uh, what you would see over the decades in this research is functionally these platinum wires becoming closer and closer together at the probe. And in doing so for the specific purpose of increasing spatial resolution. Uh, and so we're going to bring these wires closer and closer together, and then our spatial resolution is improved. But my signal goes down. So my signal is smaller and smaller and smaller. And so if you look at how potentiostat measures voltage, uh, you know, potentiostat can measure current very well and very accurately, but uh, the specifications on measuring voltage is much, uh, is much, much higher, much worse. Uh, there's, there's a much bigger range on being able to measure voltage. And so I'm also trying to measure very small voltage fields, right? So, so how can I, what technology is available to me uh, to use probes very close together for high spatial resolution, yet pull out or extract a very small signal in the background. And so this is going to employ something called a lock-in amplifier. And uh, you know, I highlight how uh, Princeton Applied Research and, and Solotron Analytical are within the Amatech family. Uh, another company, another brand uh, is Signal Recovery. And signal recovery is the innovator of the lock amplifier, just like Solotron's the innovator of the frequency response analyzer, just like Princeton Applied Research is innovator of the computer controlled potential stat. So how am I going to be able to what is lock in? How am I going to be able to employ a lock in in this technology to, to make a to make a better measurement? Well, quite simply, instead of taking these two platinum probes and positioning them in in the X direction uh, with some spatial difference, what if I only use one probe? Well, the reason, what's hard about one probe is, is voltage is a relative measurement. I need to measure it against something. And so what I'm going to do is take that one probe then and vibrate it. For what purpose? I'm going to create a, a delta in the Z direction. And that's going to allow me to, st to, to be fixed in X and Y and move in Z. And what it's going to allow me to do is keep the probe in, in one position. And as I move up and down, I'm going to be able to measure that relative voltage measurement uh, and try and extract the signal. So how can I, how, how's it going to help me extract the signal? 
is that I'm going to vibrate at a known frequency. I'm going to pick a frequency that's going to be outside the um, electromagnetic interference realm. And so typically in our system, we have an 80 hertz vibration frequency. And so this tells me that anything that is generated, you know, any response that follows a, an AC wave pattern at 80 hertz is a good response. And anything that follows, uh, you know, a different pattern, whether it's DC or AC at a different frequency, that those are, uh, that's basically noise, that's background. And so by using an internal uh, signal reference uh, generated by the lock-in and then knowing the signal frequency coming in and patching up the phase, what that allows me to do is basically really knock down all the background and recover the signal, if you will, um, from the background noise. And so the end result then is this is a million times more sensitive. And you're going to see in the data that I'm going to show in a little bit down to uh, low microvolt, nanovolt type kind of uh, measurements being able to be made here. So again, I'm going to measure a voltage, I'm going to image a current. And so why is that, uh, you know, this, this is really a, a figure adapted from my uh, electric chemical active paper that kind of just shows that distribution. The current flows between the anode and the cathode, but it creates equal potential lines that I'm going to measure with my probe. And this is a this is a key point, and I'll talk later about how we can kind of convert this back to uh, to more traditional electric chemistry uh, uh, parameters. Uh, for those interested, this is kind of the signal chain within the SVET experiment. Uh, I'm going to use uh, the the measurement of the probe is going to go into an electrometer, electrometer. It means I'm going to use this to measure voltage. Uh, there's multiple gain stages in there, so it's just a way for me to take take the, the, the measurement of the probe and, and multiply it up, basically put a magnifying glass on it and make it larger, make it easier to, for the electronics to measure. But at that point in time, it's gaining both the signal and the noise because it's gaining everything from the probe. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is gain up the signal and noise. I'm going to use that lock and amplifier to then knock out the noise. I'm going to further filter it, record that data, and move to the next uh, position. And so that is the series that I'm going to continually go through as I build up these data maps. So this is the first data that we're going to see. And let me explain to you how I made this measurement. I uh, started off with a 200 micron gold wire, uh, gold sample. And I applied a negative 10 microamps to it and used tap water as, a, uh, as, a, as an electrolyte. Uh, so this small current through the wire in an epoxy background is basically simulating a corrosion pit because I have a small area that's active and a large area that's pass is completely passive. So you, no fancy graph yet because I'm only measuring two uh, parameters. I'm only scanning in the in the x direction. So I'm moving in x direction, uh, 5,000 microns, five millimeters in the x direction, uh, and you'll see the the voltage being measured back. So a couple things that I think are very interesting. Number one is the dispersion of the field. So I told you it's a 200 micron gold wire, and I made that 200 micron, so I know the diameter of that gold wire. But we can look and we can see the, how large the field gets, even though that wire is only 200 microns. And that's an important point for many of these different techniques, is I'm not imaging the pit or the site, the corrosion site itself, I'm measuring the impact of it. I'm measuring the field generated by that pit. And that, that's gonna tell me about the intensity and, uh, and of, of, of the pit itself. So if I, if I look here and I say, where can I statistically start seeing the pit, start seeing the imaging of the pit, let's say that we start seeing this about the 500 or maybe even the 1,000 uh, position in X. And then we'll say it goes all the way to about the 4,000 position in X. So that's over 3,000 microns, I see a 200 micron the, the, the field generated by 200 micron pit. So that tells you that field is, is growing by 15x. So I think that that's very interesting, and I think another very interesting point from a measurement standpoint is really how that's not a smooth line. That's a bunch of different small points. And so if the entire peak there is just over a millivolt, uh, you can see that that is, requires that kind of microvolt measurement capability. Uh, to kind of distinguish these small signals and make smooth, smooth lines and, 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 and quality data measurement. 
So simply to make these uh, more interesting looking area maps, it's going to repeat the same experiment, but instead of just doing an X, just like a typewriter almost, I'm going to go across an X, then I'm going to increment position in Y and scan across again, and increment position in Y and scan across again, and build up a X, Y plane that gives me a measurement parameter. So this is the same data we saw on the last screen, just at different Y positions, and thus represented as a uh, three-dimensional data map. So this is the graph I referred to earlier uh, and when we when we talk it with other corrosion engineers and corrosion scientists we are just more comfortable more more commonly discuss this in terms of current and not is in terms of voltage fields generated by active sites and and so, so how can I make this a little more digestible in terms uh, that that our colleagues are more more uh, more commonly used, and so what I did here is I took the same gold wire, 200 microns, and I applied different currents. So I started at the 10 microamps and then went down to 9 and 8 and 7, 6, 5, all the way down to about negative 25 nanoamps uh, applied currents. And so then we're going to fit this to a trend line, and uh, and solve that, and it's going to give us in the y equals mx plus b form. Uh, we can see that, that the, we can correlate a measured maximum voltage to kind of what the current density is at the surface. Uh, so that is, uh, that's, a, that's, that's basically a correlation uh, coefficient to kind of convert the voltage back into an applied to a, to, a, to a current measured at the sample surface. Something else that I find very interesting, or, or very, uh, just, just uh, something else that I think is very valuable here is to look at that B, basically that, that term in the Y equals MX plus B equation uh, that will give me a, an understanding of basically the background in the experiment. Because if I'm applying a zero current, you would expect a zero voltage. We, would, we don't think that gold is going to corrode in tap water. So if in that type of a system, what is the lowest value that I can measure basically represents kind of a background uh, value to the system. And you can see here it's two microvolts. So even at these settings that allow us to measure the high voltages, we're still able to um, measure down to that kind of two microvolt uh, baseline in the environment. So I can learn a lot from measuring those gold wires, but that's not really what you know our users are interested in. And so uh, I was working with a car manufacturer, and they're starting to move to, uh, you know, working with aluminums and magnesiums and, and uh, lighter, uh, really for, 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 uh, for lightness and for fuel economy and electric vehicles and this kind of work. And so they sent me a, a sample to test through SVET and try and find some, some localized corrosion uh, comments, uh, characterization. And so, it, as you can imagine, the car manufacturer is very, uh, very secretive on what types of materials that they're studying. So uh, they said, "I'm going to send you this data. I'm going to send you this, but I'm not going to really be able to tell you much about uh, what you can expect, where to look." Right. So I take this, and uh, I really didn't know what to expect. So I, so I take a large scan area with 200 microns by 200 microns points. And so I tell you this because. I'm not always, on the first scan, we're not always looking at the highest resolution. The point here is for me to kind of do an exploratory, exploratory scan and look to see kind of where the corrosion event's happening. So I go for a scan area of 16 millimeters by 12 millimeters, uh, which is pretty large for the, t for the scale here of these times of typical experiments. And I'm going to go with a 200 micron by 200 micron point resolution. And to give you an idea, that experiment took about one hour. Uh, our probes are platinum and iridium, and we do that to kind of add some extra strength to the platinum probe. Uh, and those those probes become uh, sharp at the end to kind of give us a better resolution. and And they're usually in a, in the diameter of uh, dimensions of a uh, probe tip of about one to two microns. But I was very excited to do this experiment, which was uh, go back go back to this large experiment, and we're going to say. Okay, in this area here, in the top left-hand corner, I see some active, some activity, right? Without a doubt, there's some, there's something going on there, and uh, and we can see it kind of balanced on the on the right-hand side uh, with a larger area of a smaller magnitude, 
being uh, the orange and the red, and then a smaller area of a higher magnitude being the blue and purple uh, on the top left. And so I went in and, and let's investigate that area further at a higher resolution. And, uh, and so this is the result of those experiments then, is some time resolved corrosion images. So what we did here, the experiment took about one hour. This is a smaller scan at a higher resolution, so about the same time frame. I did these experiments over and over and over for 15 times. So basically think about these as being uh, one hour time delayed between each one just because that's the time of the scan itself. And so if we watch, let's look here at the time one. Uh, we see a purple pit up in the, the top in the middle of the graph, and then by hour three you see it start to passivate, and by hour five you see it completely passivated. Uh, so let's look. Uh, also, maybe we can look over to the to in hour five we see a new pit form uh, on the far right, and then you can see by you can see its evolution as you go through hour ten, hour twelve. Uh, it, it maximizes and then uh, passivates again, and then we have a new pit show up on the left again in hour 15. You can literally watch the corrosion process happen. And so this is something that is interesting, um, uh, and, and this is something that there's really no other way to get, this, uh, to get this data, to get the answer of where and to get the answer of intensity. Because optically, you could see pits form, but I can't tell you how intense they are. And through a poten normal potential stats, we can measure uh, uh, current flow, but I can't tell you, I can't give you the answer of where. So you can see the value of this technology now. So that was one example from a car manufacturer. Here's another example from a um, air conditioner manufacturer who's looking at corrosion at a weld. And so, but the same kind of uh, technology, same same kind of different uh, uh, thought process here, as we move through. A large exploratory scan on like 12 millimeters by 12 millimeter scans with large data points of 500 by 500 microns, and that's to go faster. And then once you find the area of interest, go back and then take that one area with a much higher resolution. And so when you say going from 500 microns by 500 microns to 50 by 50, um, that's actually 100 times more data in that scan, right? So that's the reason that you're kind of picking up resolution and character that uh, that was difficult to see when you did a large data map. So that's some applications of scanning vibrating electro technique and how it's being uh, used uh, both from a theoretical standpoint, looking at uh, gold and understanding how the pits, uh, you know, uh, voltage fields exist through the pits and then understanding how these are actually applied in, in commercial solutions, uh, in commercial evaluations of materials. So let's transition now from scanning vibrating electro technique over to localized electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Uh, this is going to use a dual probe and I'm going to apply a voltage to my system and I'm going to measure a current uh, at the probe. So I like to say this as, uh, as uh, you know, in a, in a presentation, I'll tell you that, that uh, I'm going to apply a, say the same signal to the sample and the local character of the sample is going to determine uh, what that signal does. And so active areas are going to generate current and passive areas are not. And that's going to allow me to then use that, the ratio between the global voltage and the local current to define a localized impedance spectroscopy experiment, right? And we're going to do this at different frequencies and we can do this at different probe positions. Uh, my, my kind of analogy that I'll use again in, in, a, in, a, in a seminar setting is uh, that I'm going to apply a voltage or a driving force. So I pretend that I walk up to everyone in the room and, and kick their chair. Uh, now, some people have a, an active personality, and that's going to generate a response, a, uh, uh, and that would be, you know, that, um, that would be, uh, you know, they may have an active response to their chair getting kicked, and some people are very passive and have, have no response from their chair getting kicked, and that's the same kind of thing that we're, that we're looking at here in this way. So I'm going to take a step up, and I'm going to tell you how potential that measures current, and then I'll relate that back to how we're going to measure impedance spectroscopy. Uh, so potential that's going to measure current using Ohm's law, and that's simply the ratio of, uh, excuse me, the relationship that voltage equals current times resistance. And so by using a current measurement resistor, 
uh, drawn there. I'm going to measure a voltage across that resistor and I can tell you the current flow through that resistor. And so a dry resistor inside of potential chat, this is going to be the thing that represents the current range. So why'd I tell you that? And how's that going to relate to how we're going to do impedance studies is I'm going to use a dual element probe. And so that's going to create the, my ability to measure a voltage. And the resistance is going to be the uh, conductivity of the solution and the separation of the probe elements are going to work together to build that um, functionally that current measurement resistor. So I'm going to measure a voltage using that uh, resistance, generate a current, and then I'm going to take that current and use the ratio of the voltage applied to the sample, and that's going to give me uh, the localized impedance. So let's take a step back, and this is going to talk about uh, how this works and how am I going to pick which frequencies to apply. Uh, the impedance of a resistor is frequency independent, and so the frequency of the impedance of the resistor is always defined as just Z equals R. The impedance of a capacitor is dependent on frequency, and it's inverse. So at high frequencies, the impedance of the capacitor is low, and at low frequencies, the impedance of the capacitor is high. Okay, so that's going to become important here on this next slide. Uh, because I'm going to have electrons on the left-hand side of my circuit, and I'm going to try and get them over to the right-hand side of the circuit, and it's going to depend on the path they take. It's going to depend on the frequency. And that, so let's let's start off. This is called a Randall cell, uh, the uh, because it's got three components that are in basically every electrochemical system: uh, a solution resistance, and that's shown by the first resistor out there in series. Uh, there is a charge transfer resistance, or we'll call that a polarization resistance in the corrosion community. And that capacitor is, represents the double layer capacitance uh, that exists in any electrode electrolyte um, uh, interface. So I've got an electron on the left-hand side. I'm trying to get him to the right-hand side. How am I going to do that? Everyone's got to go through that solution resistance, but then I'm going to get to uh, the next point, and i got to decide which way to go. And now at high frequency, you remember the capacitor's impedance goes to zero, or goes very low. And so that is the path of least resistance, or the path of least impedance. And so I'm going to go down through the capacitor and out. And so that's, that's really why at highest frequencies we have an estimate of solution resistance only, because that double layer shorts out. As the potential stat goes to the other, is the potential stat goes to the other extreme and, and applies very low frequency uh, AC signals, I've still got to go through that solution resistance, but then at that point, since the capacitor's impedance becomes so large, going up through the other resistor actually becomes the preferred path. And so this is why at very low frequencies, I'm going to have uh, the resistance or impedance approximated to be the sum of the solution resistance to the polarization resistance. So what does this mean from a standpoint of localized measurements? If you run this at very high frequencies, what am I losing out on? I'm losing out on most of that local character, right, because of the sample, because everything's, you know, everything's in the same solution, everything's going to have the same solution resistance, and so really, uh, you're only going to be imaging the solution resistance, so functionally, everything's going to be blue, or everything's going to be red in your data map. What you really want to do is look at the kind of lower frequencies to kind of pick up some understanding of how those that polarization resistance and those other parameters are different um, throughout the experiment. So let's look at some, some data acquisition data here. And now there's really two different ways that we can run a localized impedance uh, experiment. We can fix the probe position and sweep the frequency, or we can fix the frequency and, and change the probe position. What you don't want to do is change the probe position as you're sweeping the frequency, because both are going to change the impedance. Uh, you won't be able to model it in any way. You won't be able to, you know, that convoluted data won't, won't be able to be uh, understood in any way. But if I fix the probe position and sweep the frequency, then I've got Bode plots and Nyquist plots because nothing moved, right? And so I can actually model those data. If I run a fixed frequency, uh, I get a data map because I'm measuring something with a changing probe position but I have no way to model that data, right? Because it's a single frequency. So it's becoming popular as kind of the, the combination of the two, I guess, is kind of taking maps at different frequencies or taking um, uh, sweeps at different probe positions. So the system can do both. It's just uh, the data, uh, what, you're, what you're measuring and the data and how you're going to interpret the data are going to be different. 
So applications of LEIS, so it's similar to SVET, but it's got the advantages of an AC measurement. And when you think about that, really a lot of that comes back to coatings. Uh, so we can look at coating failure in a localized way. We can watch uh, how the coating's capacitance changes as it takes up water and how it starts to fail and kind of do that, do all that, um, all that application of impedance spectroscopy on the coatings and, and bare metal materials for the corrosion community. This just, again, answers the question of where. And you see spatial resolution, you start seeing this, uh, uh, you start understanding uh, the impact of that on, uh, on the localized uh, corrosion measurements. So now we can transition over to scanning droplet cell. And uh, this is a, a basically a head, uh, a Teflon head that has uh, some, uh, it's been mechanically designed to allow the flow of electrolyte past a reference electrode and counter electrode and, uh, and make surface, make contact with the surface. And so what this is going to be used for then, if I take this little cartoon to see inside the, the head of the electrolyte, of the, uh, of the, if I can use this to, to look inside the head and kind of see the path of the flow of the electrolyte, uh, electrolyte's going to flow in through the blue line. It's going to go past the reference electrode down uh, to the tip where there's going to be a little aperture or opening. Uh, that's going to form a solution uh, interface with the sample. And then I'm going to come back out by the counter electrode on the red path of the uh, of the uh, experiment. And so what this does is it's going to constantly allow me to refresh solution and get those corrosion products out of there. Corrosion products are always there, and if you're working in like ASTM cells, uh, like our K0047, uh, what's going to happen is uh, the, the so there's so much solution that the concentration of corrosion products may not be too high, may not impact your results. But here, if I'm on the hundreds of microns uh, size dot uh, of solution or droplet of solution, uh, that's a really low volume. It can cause a high concentration of corrosion products. So that's why we're going to flow the uh, electrolyte over the, uh, over the sample. And here in this image, we can see the, uh, on the left-hand side here, a fixed uh, picture of the, of the Teflon head. Uh, but keeping very close to the sample surface, but not touching it. And you can kind of see some glisten on the dot uh, droplet there as well. And the right-hand side, you can see the formation of the droplet, and you can see it being uh, uh, moved across the sample surface. Uh, this is a gold disc, uh, again, sealed in this epoxy. And so just like with LEIS, I can, I can change the position or I can sweep the signal. So, so who is doing either one of these? Uh, changing the position, potentially you may do something like, let's take, a, uh, let's take a, a corrosion sample and apply a potential higher, more positive than E-pit, and then scan across the sample surface, and you're going to be able to see where pits occur. Uh, another way to look at this is the sweeping signal, and that's to basically run across and, and run something like a taffel plot or impedance plot or uh, constant current or constant voltage over uh, in different locations. And so this gives you the ability to be able to kind of look at subsets of a large sample without cutting the sample. So other the, you know the competitive technology would be to take that take that uh, large sample and cut it into hundreds or thousands of little little squares and then run impedance plots or run uh, electrochemical tests on each and every one of those little uh, hundreds or thousands of, of samples and uh, but then you're going to have all these edge effects and that's going to take uh, you know it's going to take a tremendous amount of time uh, to try and to try and make those measurements and so this is this is how this can this is the value that uh, the scanning droplet probe applies right there. And this just kind of uh, summarizes that for us. Another thing, then you have the parameter of changing flow rate, uh, and you can turn it off if you if you need to uh, or want to uh, make the this setup a good bit easier. So I'm just going to do a quick quick highlight over scanning electrical microscopy. We've got an entire different presentation on that technique because it is so versatile. Uh, but the components of an SCCM are the same positioning system. It's an ultra microelectrode that's been polished down to a specific geometry and often in scanning electrochemical microscope work uh, we're using a bipotentiostat to allow us to control the sample and the probe itself at different potentials. And the ability to do that really drives its versatility uh, because I have the ability to kind of kind of change or, or control the state of the probe and control the state of the sample. 
um, and have high spatial resolution because of the tip and the way it's uh, the way it's positioned. We'll talk about that in a second. And I can look at concentration gradients, and I'll show you the uh, the impact that could have for the corrosion community. So how am I going to position the probe is through for an SCCM experiment through something called an approach curve, and that's literally the probe approaching or becoming you know closer in z direction over a sample surface. And then as I get very close to the sample surface, something's going to happen. Uh, that, that, res that bulk response is going to change to a local response. And if you are approaching a conductor, you can see the local response is going to increase in current. And if you're approaching an insulator, the local response is going to be a decrease in current. And so this allows us to then understand where to position the probe. Uh, so for this example, it would be about 1,500 microns down from where we were before, and uh, and then you're going to get a big a big delta in that local response because if you think about resolution being functionally the ratio between what you would see over a um, over a, uh, a an insulator to a conductor, you know that ratio, you can see the difference, and you can see this area map over here on the right uh, of that kind of gold disk sample. So let's go back and look at, at some different different uses of this. Is is uh, if I'm controlling the generator, so using one potential stat on the sample, and I can generate a current or generate an electrochemical reaction at that generator, and that's going to make a concentration gradient, and then I'm going to use the uh, other potential stat in my probe to make that measurement. And so something people are working on within the corrosion community specifically is ion selective electrodes. And so whether this is a uh, whether uh, it's a pH electrode or whether it's a chloride ion sensitivity electrode, uh, that's a that's a field of interest here for uh, the corrosion community. So we'll talk about a, a, a variant on this in just a second. But here are some typical SCCM applications, and and it's everything from uh, you know from imaging and biological systems and semiconductors and fabrication. So you can see the the versatility of the technique. Uh, but then we can see heterogeneous kinetics is really where the uh, where that where that corrosion community lives. We've got an exclusive partnership with uh, with a European facility that uh, des has designed uh, what we refer to as our VS stylus or soft probe technology. And so what this does is instead of using a microelectrode, which is really a, a hard glass uh, with a, um, a platinum wire, gold wire. Uh, what we're going to do here is use kind of a softer plastic. And so what that's going to do then is going to allow us to etch uh, this in this polymer and build a carbon, um, fill carbon paint. And that's going to give us basically a carbon electrode uh, sealed in uh, this, this flexible polymer. And so by doing the same approach curve then, what's going to happen is, uh, you know, we, we always talk about not touching the surface and non-contact. This is, this is an opposite take on that, and that is you really want to touch the sample surface. And so what's going to happen is the probe approaches the sample surface, the current's going to start changing in that localized way, right? So it's going to either go up or go down uh, as it get very close to the sample surface. But if I continue to go closer and closer to the sample, uh, eventually, with this technology, uh, the as I get closer, the current's not going to change. And so, as I move as I move the probe closer to the sample surface, the point in time where the current no longer changes means that I've made contact with the sample surface. And so, in a hard probe, that's a that's a bad thing. But here, it's a really good thing, and I'm going to use that to my advantage because it's going to bend. And what that's going to do is it's going to give me a known distance away from the sample surface, a controlled distance away from the sample surface. And it's much more gentle than if you'd make contact with a hard probe. And then what that's going to do then is it's going to allow me to position a probe um, and make a measurement as I scan across the sample surface. So even on a flat sample, there's real advantage to that. But it's even more advantageous in a corrosion type sample that's on like corrugated material. So something where the probe to sample distance, where, the, where the, the sample's not flat. And so if the sample's not flat, that means you would have a changing probe to sample distance throughout the course of the experiment. And in doing that, you would, you would, uh, you would, convolute, uh, you would convolute the results if you weren't able to maintain a constant distance away. And this allows us to do that. And so here's an example on SCCM on highly corrugated samples, and uh, and you can see as I as I move across the corrugated sample, I can still actually resolve uh, the electrochemical measurements. 
So we'll, we'll end uh, with a quick discussion on scanning Kelvin probe. And so this is a, uh, a, a vibrating capacitance technique uh, who's designed to work on to measure work function difference between a probe and a sample, typically in atmospheric conditions. And what's exciting for electrochemistry communities, you can take that work function difference and correlate it back to corrosion potential. So how's this going to work is I'm going to have a probe that is made out of a metal. And so it's going to have uh, electrons that are going to have an average energy level. I'm going to have a sample that's also metal, that's also going to have probes, uh, that's also going to have electrons of an average energy level. And as you connect these two things, and now I'm not going to connect them by touching them, I'll connect them inside the, the measurement system, the average energy level is going to change. They're going to equilibrate, right? And so that's going to put a positive charge on one sample surface and a negative charge on another sample surface. And if you have uh, two parallel plates that have opposite charges, and a dielectric, here being air, that's separating these two things and not allowing them to combine, you build a capacitor. And guess what? I, I, I have technology that measures capacitance. And so within the uh, system then, what I'm going to do is keep changing that fixed voltage back and forth and tweaking that until that capacitance goes to zero. And when I have uh, established, reestablished that state, now I can record that backing voltage, that voltage uh, recorded there, and that's going to be um, uh, the same value then as my work function difference uh, between uh, the probe and the sample surface. So I'm making relative work function differences measurements. Here's some examples. Uh, top right hand corner is a is a coded system uh, because what really happens then if you look if you take that if you take that sample and code it, all that's really changed is you've changed the uh, the dielectric, but you're still being able to measure that uh, that that metal under the coating. Uh, the below that is a uh, is an image of our test sample, which is a uh, a zinc uh, coated or galvanized steel where that where that zinc coating has been etched away in a, in a small location. SQP data uh, represented here, again, is an optical image and, and, and rotated around. But something I was really excited to, to highlight at this year's meeting is our patent pending uh, 10 micron and 1 micron probe. And you can see the difference in resolution as you go to 1 micron probes. Uh, you can really pick up a layer of detail that's unavailable uh, on the 10 micron probe or even the 500 micron probe on the left. If I take those same image, those same locations and image it with a 1 micron probe on the right, uh, you can see that high level of resolution. Now this experiment took a very long time to get a large sample sc scan of, millimeter, of 6 millimeters by 5 millimeters it looks like. Uh, at one micron by one micron step. So, you know, I mean, think about that. It's millions and millions and millions of data points uh, in this in this graph. Um, but that allows me to give that kind of ability, resolution uh, capability. And you can see uh, the, the capability system to make uh, reproducible measurements there by showing a single line on the uh, on the far right. So in summary, uh, samples are often non-uniform, let's say in the corrosion community, are always non-uniform. Uh, they can contain local uh, anodic and cathodic sites or defects in the coating. Uh, localized measurements complement bulk experiments uh, by adding spatial resolution. And I think, I think it would be disingenuous for anyone to say that you should only do localized electrochemical measurements or that you could only do uh, uh, bulk electrochemical measurements or really that you should, you know, I, I consider these complementary also to weight loss measurements and other, other types of, of pieces of the puzzle as we kind of work together to kind of figure out uh, the, how our samples react in different environments uh, and the, and different scanning experiments all have different applications and different resolutions, which kind of underscores the, the value of, of a workstation approach where you have a single um, high resolution, high scan area uh, platform and all controlled in a single software package uh, that approaches, allows you to approach uh, the localized uh, corrosion measurements in, 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 a, in a new and exciting way and get some information that other technology cannot provide you. So I appreciate your attention and hope you will go to our website and contact us if you have any questions uh, or if you want to see any other of these educational talks. Have a good day.